my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Expectful, the number one guided meditation and sleep app for your fertility, pregnancy, and motherhood journey. Just like you probably take a prenatal vitamin for your body, Expectful's meditations are like a prenatal vitamin for your mind and can help you have a happier, healthier journey to parenthood. Whether you are trying to conceive, pregnant, or postpartum, everything in the Expectful app was made just for this special moment in your life and created based on interviews with hopeful, expecting, and new parents just like you. Ready to reduce stress, improve sleep, and connect with your little one? Go to expectful.com slash birth hour or download Expectful in the app store to get started with a free trial today. Expectful.com slash birth hour will get you an extended free trial of 14 days rather than seven days. I'm especially excited about their new hypnobirthing course, which comes with the regular subscription to Expectful. So again, go to expectful.com slash birth hour to get started. Stay tuned at the end of this episode, and I'll be talking to Anissa all about Expectful with a special focus on self-care during pregnancy and motherhood. Today's guest is Megan. She's going to be sharing her experience having a partial molar pregnancy that includes a loss, and then she shares her two birth stories at the hospital with midwives, one with an epidural and one without. Let's hear from Megan. Hi, Megan. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Hi, thanks for having me. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Yeah, I um, live on the seacoast in New Hampshire, and I live with my husband, Ryan, and I have two kids. I have Isla, and she's two and a half, and I have Tatum, and he will be one on March 9th. And currently, I teach first grade in a neighboring town, um, and I'm actually signed up right now to train and get my certification as a postpartum doula. So I hope to do that and get into um, working with mothers at some point. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start with your your journey to becoming pregnant. All right. So Ryan and I got married in 2016. And we knew we wanted to have kids pretty soon right off the bat. We'd been together since high school, and we knew it was something we both really wanted. And we were going to be going on a honeymoon in February 2017. So we were like, okay, let's hold off. And after the honeymoon, we'll start trying to get pregnant. But of course, um, we got pregnant before that. And it was like right around when Zika was becoming big. So we were a little concerned about that and everything. Um, but we went on our honeymoon. All was well. I had um, all signs pointing to a healthy pregnancy and had my first ultrasound scheduled at nine weeks. And I'd been feeling a little bit nauseous, a little bit sick. Of course, it was my first pregnancy. So I didn't know all the signs and hadn't experienced it before. But we went to our ultrasound, and at nine weeks, there was no heartbeat. Um, I had a missed miscarriage. The baby had stopped developing at seven weeks. So that was really unexpected. I feel like you go yeah. into your first pregnancy really, you know, with high hopes. And at least for me, I didn't hear about a lot of mm -hmm. miscarriages before having kids. I feel like after you experience it or after you have... Um, children and speaking with friends, you hear about it a lot, but right. I didn't. Um, so they kind of went over the options and I decided to get a DNC because, um, although I try to do things as natural as I can, when I can, that was just the best option for me. I couldn't picture myself going into school, teaching first graders every day, just wondering when I was going to miscarry or when that process was going to start. So I went ahead and scheduled a DNC. Um, and after that, it came out, my doctor had told me I had what was called a partial molar pregnancy. Um, 
So in like a normal pregnancy, you have like the normal amount of chromosomes. You have 46 and in a partial molar, the egg is fertilized by two sperms. So there's 69 chromosomes. So if you have a full molar pregnancy, it's all just cysts forming and mine was partial. So it's like cysts were forming and a partial embryo and placenta. Um, and I know with a full molar, it happens in like one in 1000 pregnancies. And this is less than that, the partial, but it gave me some comfort knowing that this was just like a chromosomal abnormality and there was nothing we could do about it. But of course, like I love to research everything. I love to get talk to people about their experiences. So I was just like all over trying to get info about this. And, um, so yeah, it ended up that my doctor talked to doctors in Boston to get the most updated information about partial molars because previously they told people to wait a year to try again because you want your HCG levels to be at zero for several months because, there's a risk of some type of cancer and you need to be able to differentiate that versus a pregnancy. Um, yeah. So I in for blood work, testing my HCG levels. I found out about the miscarriage in April and then I was testing. And then in July I got the go ahead to start trying again. I had been at zero HCG for a little bit now and I could start trying. And I feel really lucky that my doctor kind of looked into that because I did speak to one woman who had the same and she was told to wait a year by her doctor. Um, and although in the grand scheme of things, a year isn't that long and some people wait much longer to get pregnant whenever I think you want to get pregnant, you're like, okay, let's start right now. Right. So, yeah. Every single yeah. cycle feels like an yeah. eternity. Exactly. So that was really, I feel really lucky. Um, and then, yeah. And that kind of leads into my first, um, healthy pregnancy. We became pregnant with, um, our daughter in September of 2017 I found out immediately when I could test because I was paying attention. Um, and we were really excited, of course, very anxious after experiencing a miscarriage. You kind of look at every little sign and make sure it's healthy. Um, they did schedule me for an ultrasound at six weeks. So that was giving me some comfort. So the pregnancy went well. I was extremely sick the entire time. I kept getting... Um, sinus infections that were horrendous. I forgot how horrible those were because I haven't had one since I was a child. <laughs> and I also weirdly got lice when I was pregnant, which I know is not a side effect of the pregnancy, but I've never had it before. Oh, and that's not fun. Oh my God. No lice at like 25 weeks pregnant or plus, I can't even remember with my husband, just like combing through my hair was oh just gosh. miserable. Yep. So that was an interesting experience. Um, and had some bleeding in the beginning of the pregnancy, which was nerve wracking, but overall, um, it went well besides being sick and tired. Um, but once I was past that hump of the first trimester and, um, seeing the ultrasounds. And once I had the baby moving, I was just a lot more at ease with the pregnancy. Um, and I was due in June that year. I knew I wasn't sure that I was going to go back to school. So, um, I decided to use my sick days and just stop working after Memorial Day in New Hampshire, we typically go to school until like mid June. Um, so I decided I was just going to take after Memorial Day off and spend some time resting. And um, that was the best thing. But of course, she came late. <laughs> I think that always happens when people take the time off. She just decided to um, not come on her duty. So I was due June 6th and she came on June 10th. So she was born on a Sunday and that Wednesday I started having contractions keeping me up and then they kind of subsided in the day Thursday. I didn't really have anything. I lost my mucus plug. Um, another early sign was I was having diarrhea 
and but nothing, no real contractions. And then Thursday night again, sure enough, contractions, no sleep. I was trying so hard to um, like relax and not get too excited, do all the things that we learned. And that didn't work. I was just awake. Um, and then Friday I had my family over for like a big barbecue. I was just really tired after not sleeping, but that night my contractions picked up and I was just up and not sleeping at all. And I remember my husband hadn't packed for the hospital and that night he could tell they were worse and he was just running around all over and I'm yelling at him, trying to tell him to go to sleep. Someone needs to rest here, but he just could not. So we were both up all night, um, which later on in this story just kind of wasn't good for either of us. But um, so I was contracting all night on that Friday night. And um, at 745 on Saturday, I was feeling like, okay, let's head into the hospital. So we planned a hospital birth. I don't think I even talked about that. And where I go, there's OBs and midwives. So you see a midwife. Um, The midwife um, is with you at your birth unless there's complications or something. And then you would have an OB. They're always there too. But there's a birth center at a hospital. It's three minutes down the road. My husband works for them. It just felt really comfortable for us. And I had a really great experience with my doctors and my midwives. Um, I rotated through all the midwives because it was kind of like you get who was on call and I liked all of them luckily. So that was good. So, um, anyways, going back, we went into the hospital at 745 and I was only two centimeters dilated. So they sent us home. And again, I know that's super frustrating for some people. And it was frustrating for me that I was expecting to be a little more after having contractions for three nights. But knowing I was only three minutes away was like, okay, it's not at least I don't have a hall to get back home. So we went home and I labored at home. Um, all day long. And it started, my contractions were getting closer. They started um, getting more intense. I started having a hard time speaking through them. So at 4.15 that day on Saturday, we went back to the birth center. My contractions were two to five minutes apart. um, And I was only three centimeters dilated. So that was frustrating. Also, I had told myself before that I didn't want to get checked too much because I know I'm the type of person that if I wasn't making progress, too much progress, I would get into my head. Um, so I try to let it go. Um, but I was feeling extremely exhausted and they said you, you could go back home. Um, gave me some options. You could go back home. You could just stay here or we could give you therapeutic rest, like a shot of morphine, I think. And that could help you to get some sleep. And ultimately, I went into labor and birth being really open-minded. My plan was to try for an epidural free birth. But I was just trying to keep an open mind. Obviously, never having experienced it before. I didn't want to get my heart really set on something too much and then um, let myself down. So I was trying to keep an open mind, but knowing that that was my ultimate goal of, um, not getting epidural, I said, okay, I would like to get the therapeutic rest to give me some sleep. I had been up for days and, um, I thought that would help. So I got that around 5 PM and that was interesting. It's like you were asleep, but I could still feel the contractions, but I was still able to like rest and kind of sleep through them. So that lasted for about like two, two and a half hours. And then I woke up um, and we just went over options. I just kind of labored on my own and by like 1030. So I don't know. I was checked at like 415. I was three at 1030. I was four centimeters. So I was like, okay, Um, just I wanted to try the jacuzzi at that point. So 
they don't have jacuzzis in the rooms at the hospital that I was at, but there was a jacuzzi room. And luckily I was the only woman laboring, which was wonderful. So I kind of got free reign of like using that. It was always open. I used it twice. Um, so I went in there and I stayed in the jacuzzi till 1230 and oh my God, water is such a relief. I just, it was like the best thing ever. Um, I was able to relax and just listen to music and it was like quiet and it was amazing. Um, so after I got out of the tub at like 1230, I was dilated to a six or a seven. So that was really encouraging. Um, that helped me kind of get far along that relaxation. But then I was feeling like around then like immense pressure and they didn't see my bag of waters at that point, but I hadn't felt it break. So they were thinking maybe it broke in the tub. They weren't sure, but all I know is, and I've heard women talk about this on your podcast before where my body felt like it was involuntarily trying to push. And I felt like I was trying to stop like an elephant from coming out of me. And it just like, I was trying so hard not to bear down starting at that like six, seven centimeters. And they were like, okay, you can't push yet. But it was, that became the challenge for me. Um, obviously the contractions and working through them, we know that's difficult, but like, for me in this labor, like that holding in and trying to avoid bearing down was really hard. Um, but I just kept laboring in the room. I was using the ball. I was using the bed. I was using the mat on the floor. And, um, after a little while I got to like eight or nine centimeters and I basically just like stalled out there trying not to bear down. My body was still trying to like push with every contraction. Um, and I had some cervical swelling. So they were really like, really try not to. And I was pretty calm in labor, but when someone tells you not to like push and your body's pushing, I was like, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to stop it. Like, I know it's so hard. I have a baby trying to come out of me. Um, so that was really difficult and, that is just what sticks out in my mind the most. Um, so my midwife was like, you made such good progress in the tub. Let's try it again. So by this time it's like 3 AM and I had a much easier time coping in the tub. So they got me back in there and that was really great. Um, but then I spiked a fever. So while I'm in the tub, they're like trying to put ice in the tub to cool me down. Um, which was interesting. And then they were like, yeah, we should just get you out of the tub. This, we don't really want you to have a fever. So I got right out of the tub and I just remember, I knew I was the only one laboring, but at this point I felt like <laughs> I was like nine centimeters for so long. And you get to that like animalistic place. If anybody was in the halls of the hospital, like, I'm so sorry, because I was basically just walking around naked, trying not to, like, go have contractions while walking down the hall, um, which was, my husband and I look back and laugh, but I think he was a little bit scared in the moment because <laughs> he didn't know what was happening, obviously. Um, so anyways we go back in the room and continue laboring. And I was just at the point where I was completely falling asleep in between contractions. And, um, I tried the nitrous. They had the nitrous at the hospital. I tried that. And that was the poor nurse, like set it up. And like I said, I was calm during labor and I wasn't mean or anything, but they set up the nitrous for me and I tried it like once and then like was like, I can't do this. It's really hard. It was really hard for me to manage holding the mask to my face while having contractions. Um, so that didn't work. And I just kept laboring and falling asleep and I was really exhausted. Um, in my birth plan, I had said like, basically, please don't ask me for an epidural. I'll let you know if I want anything. But I feel like you get into this such this headspace. I was in labor land and I was just like pushing through and I like didn't even think about epidural. 
I was just kind of doing it, but, um, I was really exhausted. And my midwife actually asked me, do you want the epidural? Um, you still have to push. And I know you've been up for days and I said, yes. And she did apologize after actually she was, she was like, I'm so sorry. I realized you said you didn't want me to do that. And, and at that point I was like, it's okay. Like I'm at peace with this decision right now. I, I'm exhausted. Um, and I had been doing that for so long that she was just not making progress. She was just stuck at nine centimeters and I just needed a little bit of rest to be able to push. So they call down anesthesiologist and I get my first epidural at five o'clock in the morning. I got ready to lay down. My husband immediately passed out, of course, next to me and they shut off the lights and I thought it had worked. They were like, how do you feel? And I said, yeah, I feel good. And then as soon as everybody left the room, I realized it did not work. And I was still like fully having contractions, could not lay down. I don't know what happened, but it did not work. My husband just like shot up as soon as he heard me. And we called the nurse back in. And at this point, I was having like extreme pain again, fever still, and I was really dehydrated. So I didn't realize I actually was looking at my labor notes and talking to my doctor about this before. I didn't realize like, I think they were a little bit concerned about me. They did some assessment that I hadn't heard of because of my fever and dehydration. And I knew there was like, they had extra people in the room and I, and I thought it was because my daughter's heart rate started um, concerning them. I also think they were a little concerned about me as well. And it's amazing how you don't realize serious situations that are happening sometimes because they were so calm and um, kept me so calm. But looking back in the notes was interesting. Um, so then they called down the anesthesiologist and he didn't get back until like 7.20. So my first one was supposed to be, was at five, didn't work. And he came back at like 7.20. I'm not sure if he went home. Um, I know he was sleeping the first time. But so during that epidural, um, my husband was holding my hands and my husband is someone who he was so concerned about me and he hadn't slept for so long and he also didn't eat. So highly recommend dads, you need to eat if you're in a marathon labor because he's holding my hands during the second epidural, just trying to keep me focused and still, and then I could just see it in his face. And he was like, I need to leave. So as I'm like shaking and getting my second epidural, he leaves the room to like find water. And I'm like, what's happening? And they're like calling out to the nurse's station. Like, um, you got to keep an eye on the father of the baby. He might pass out. So I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So a little note, it's okay to take care of yourselves, dads, especially if you're in a long labor have a little snack and you better bet he was eating snacks during my next labor. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Cause I was like, we can't have you passing out right now. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, anyways, they broke my water. I did have a bag of water still and they did artificial rupture of membranes around nine 30 and saw some meconium staining. And then she, And my second epidural worked, so I got a little sleep, but they kept turning me because of baby's heart rate. Broke my water at 9.30 um, and had me start pushing around 10. And the epidural was in a really great place where I could feel my contractions and I could feel myself when I started pushing and we had music playing. It was just a really beautiful experience and it was really um, special for us. And after being so tired and it having going and it went on for so long my husband and I were both really emotional but um I pushed for like an hour a little under an hour and like I said I could feel my contractions which was so nice I was really worried with if I did get an epidural that I would be completely numb I had a friend who had that happen and I just couldn't imagine pushing and not (laughs) feeling it at all so I did 
I pushed, I had the mirror. I saw her when she was born. She came out at 1127. Um, and Ryan got to help deliver her and he brought her up to my chest and, um, they always practice delayed cord clamping at my hospital and they do skin to skin for a really long time. So that was amazing. And, um, we were so sleepy, but obviously that rush of adrenaline happened and she did the breast crawl right away. Um, yeah. And it was in the end, it was kind of a marathon. It was tiring, but, and I got the epidural, but in the end it all happened how it was supposed to. And it was a really great experience. That's so great. And then how was your, your recovery? My recovery was good. I, um, did have a second degree tear, but it wasn't too bad. Um, I felt okay after the epidural because I feel like it was kind of light. So I kind of had more control of my body after like getting, Mm. going to the shower and stuff, which was nice. Um, but yeah, my recovery, it went well, it was pretty good. All right. And then how much time between, um, getting that birth and getting pregnant again? So I had her in June and when she turned one in 2019, um, that's when I got pregnant with my son. Okay. So yeah. how was that finding out you were pregnant and then how your pregnancy went? Um, it was good. So we are really lucky and I have friends who really have struggled with fertility and I know that's kind of triggering for some people to hear that, um, it was easy for me to get pregnant. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was, I got pregnant that first month we started trying. I just, I am aware that that's not the case for everybody. And, um, I understand that. Um, but we, we got pregnant in June, 2019 and, uh, it was really exciting. I was still nursing. So, um, it was a really great time for me to be pregnant though, because I'm a teacher. So I was off most of the summer. I worked a little bit, but not the same schedule. So I was really sick again that first trimester. So it was nice to be able to be home. But obviously when you have a crazy toddler, um, hanging on you, it's a little bit different, not as restful, but I took a lot of naps with her. Uh, and the pregnancy was really great. I felt much better. I did have in the beginning and uh, another weird thing. I was sick. I had just like sinusy stuff in the beginning and then got hand, foot, mouth with along with my entire family, which Ugh. another thing. Perks like, of being around kids a lot. Right. Exactly. I was <laughs> like, oh my God. So that was interesting. Um, and I was still nursing. So that was like just tiring. But um, mm-hmm. my daughter weaned when she was when she was 15 months, right at the beginning of my second trimester, which was interesting because my midwife said my milk was probably changing, getting mm-hmm. ready for the baby at that point. So that was kind of cool. Um, anyways, the pregnancy was great. So with both of them, I felt really sick and I had like weird things happen, but I just, I have a love hate relationship with being pregnant. Like I, that first trimester is so hard, but I love my body when I'm pregnant. I just feel like I love feeling the baby. I love the big belly. So I really embrace that this time and had a much healthier pregnancy. I wasn't sick all the time and I felt really good. Um, although I didn't exercise as much as I did with my first pregnancy, I still felt really great. Um, this time uh, I had the challenge of, I had a lot of pelvic, issues and hip issues after my first birth with my daughter. So my husband is a physical therapist. So he really advocated for me to go to pelvic floor PT, which I really strongly recommend for any pregnant mom or postpartum mom or anybody. It's wonderful. And there's a lot that we don't know, or we don't realize is an issue. Um, I'm pretty sure I had a little bit of a prolapse after Isla and I was just walking around like that, not realizing that that pain was an issue. So that was really helpful for me in preparing, um, for my labor with my son and, um, yeah, great pregnancy besides that little issue. Yeah. Okay. 
So um, how did labor start for you this time? He was due March 3rd. He was born March 9th, so I was a little overdue, mm-hmm. but he was due, uh, born on a Sunday, I believe, and 3 a.m. No, he was born on a Monday, but 3 a.m. on Sunday, I woke up to go to the bathroom, and um, as I was there, I like felt a little wet. And it wasn't much, so I was doing the classic thing of, like, did I pee my pants or is my water breaking? And this time, I was GBS positive, which I was not the first time. So they said they want me to come in at 511, and I kept being like, are you sure I have to come in at 511? I didn't want to be at the hospital for as long as I was the time before. So I kept being like, are you sure you want me to come in at 511? Can I push it a little bit? I'm not that far away. What would happen if I didn't get the amount of antibiotics that you're telling me I need to get? Um, But then with that happening, I was like, "Ugh, okay, now if this is my water, like, what do I do? I wasn't having contractions. So I just decided it was 3.30 in the morning. I was going back to bed. I knew what happened last time. I was exhausted. It was days. And I just was adamant on getting enough rest to go into labor. So I went to bed, no contractions, maybe a little bit of cramping. And then I woke up at 6 and I had some contractions, but really inconsistent, manageable. I feel like labor wasn't really starting. It was just kind of there. Um, And I like didn't want to call the doctor because I knew they were going to tell me you're GBS positive. It sounds like your water might have broke. We're going to want you to come in and test it. Um, so I was being a little stubborn because I really wanted to labor at home as much as possible. But eventually I did call the doctor and they were like, yeah, why don't you come in? We'll test it and see if it was your water that broke. Um, so I said, okay. And made my husband go get me a bagel sandwich and a coffee and said, I'm going to eat this first, drink some water, have a little cup of coffee before we go. So I was trying to stall a little bit. Nothing was happening in that course of that time. Of course, my contractions didn't really start. And I almost this time wanted my water to break because everything I heard, you know, I heard the second baby flies out. And when your water breaks, like things just get started And of course I shouldn't have like fed into the ideas of that possibly happening because I've listened to all the birth stories on your podcast and I've heard many birth stories where you never know what's going to happen. But I was like, okay, my water broke. So maybe it's going to start any second. And that wasn't the case. So after I ate my bagel sandwich, we went to the hospital. It was like 930 ish. And they didn't do a cervical check because they wanted to minimize the risk of infection with being GBS positive and the rupture of membranes because it was my water they tested. So I said I wanted to just labor and reassess in 12 hours after my rupture of membranes. And so I kind of walked, I bounced, I danced. I was really bored because nothing was happening. And I kind of was just like ready for labor, like in a good space and a good mindset. I was like consciously thinking of my daughter at home because I really had only spent one night away from her. And I was just thinking she was with my mom, who's amazing and she loves, but I just was thinking, how long is this going to be? Am I going to be away from her for days? So I kind of had that in the back of my mind, which I really shouldn't have been worried about, but I was. So 12 hours later, 3.30, we kind of discussed options. No progress, not much was happening at all. Um, And I will say my midwife kind of just like laid out all the options for me. She was pressuring me in no way to make any decision. She was giving me just like information. Like we can wait it out. She said normally after water breaking within 24 hours, typically like women go into labor spontaneous labor on their own. So we can wait it out. We could do some miso. You could take oral miso and try to get that going. You could do Pitocin, but she kind of, that was the one thing she was like, we don't really have to go there yet. Like, but gave me kind of the information, which I really appreciate. I've never felt pressured to do anything, um, which is really important to me. So 
at 3.30, I decided to do the oral miso just because I was like really ready to go. I was feeling rested and I was drinking an enormous amount of water the whole time because I did not want to get dehydrated. My husband was eating and drinking. We were ready to go. So um, at that point, they still didn't do a cervical check. So took the miso, really did nothing. I had mild cramping. I was walking around. I was doing all the things, but nothing was really picking up. Um, So that's when I decided to go ahead and do Pitocin. And that's kind of funny because I was so adamant on not wanting to be induced. And I would go as long as possible without being induced in pregnancy And I was also adamant about intermittent monitoring because in the beginning of my labor with Isla, they had me hooked up for a while, which wasn't typical for my hospital, but it was so uncomfortable. So my whole pregnancy, I was like, I want intermittent monitoring and it's such a big deal. And on Pitocin, you have to be monitored. But luckily they had a wireless monitor. But I just think, of course, that went like the opposite of what I planned. Yeah. Did you feel a difference with the wireless option or no? It felt a little bit better. Like it definitely gave me more freedom Mm -hmm. with that band around. Like I just laying in bed. Oh, it's tight and just uncomfortable. It made my back hurt. Mm. But um Yeah, I did notice though, like luckily it was waterproof because again, I was like, I want to get in the jacuzzi that really helped me. So I, I was also adamant about that and it was, it was waterproof. So that's really nice. (laughs) It was really nice that I had that option. So I just kept, kept that on and was walking around the unit was, um, using the birthing ball a lot by 11. I was managing really well. I was having more discomfort, that Pitocin really kicks in. And, um, I was starting to feel more uncomfortable and I got in the jacuzzi like at 12. Um, and I was in there for maybe like an hour, but because, so they were kind of flexible with it, but the monitor and I could get in with it, but it kept slipping. Um, so they were having a hard time picking up the heart rate and they had to keep coming in and adjusting it. And it just, it kind of like ruined the whole effectiveness of the tub. Um, I feel like I couldn't relax in there because they kept coming in and fixing the monitor. And I, I had the, um, IV in my hand for when I needed the antibiotics and I had to keep that out. So I feel like the first time I was really just like free to like do what I needed to do in the tub. And this time I couldn't. So, Um, I got out of there because it just wasn't doing it for me, which was really sad because it was such a good pain management tool for me in that first labor. Um, so I got out of there and just kept laboring in the room and I was trying to like rest between contractions because I was starting to get really tired again. They did check me around 1am and I was four centimeters dilated. Um, just kept laboring and... I was using the ball a lot this pregnancy and the mat and I was coping really well. Um, by 3 a.m. I was having that rectal pressure again and in my hips and I just knew that was a good sign. Hopefully I was dilated more and at that point I was seven centimeters and I just, my mindset this time, I just was so much more aware and not as tired. I did get to the point where I was falling asleep in between contractions again, because although it wasn't as long, it was still like 24 hours about not of hard labor, but altogether with my body getting exhausted. But, um, so my poor husband, like at this point, seven centimeters, it was picking up. I was doing well, breathing contractions, but, and like trying to keep my stance open through contractions and everyone was so positive around me. The whole birth team that I had there was so supportive of me not getting an epidural, even with all the other interventions I had to kind of kickstart the labor They were really supportive. I had the same midwife who was with me for the majority of my first labor, the one who asked me if I wanted an epidural. She didn't ask me this time. Um, And she was super supportive. But my poor husband, something that really helped me this time was just hanging from his neck. (laughs) So 
my whole body weight during contractions. I just hung from his neck and it felt really good for me. And he never complained once until like the next day when he like couldn't move his neck because I was just hanging from it. Um, but that was great for me. It felt really good and helped me to manage my pain. Um, so by 515, I had that increased like pressure and my hips were just intense. The nurse was doing hip squeezes, which felt really good. And at 515, I was nine centimeters. So that was really exciting. And I was getting really tired. They were trying to have me lay down in between contractions because I, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't, I was like falling asleep and falling to the ground, well, not the ground, falling on the bed. Um, and originally they like had brought in the birth stool and had that and we're really like excited for that. But I was just, I ended up getting in the bed towards the end there because I, I just couldn't keep myself up anymore. I was really tired. Um, so I kind of got in the bed and at one point I told my midwife, I'm really feeling pushy and I'm having a really hard time not holding back kind of that feeling I had from six centimeters with my daughter. Um, so I was kind of like, Oh my God, please don't tell me to hold it in because I will kill you right now. Um, cause I can't hold it in. That was awful. But she kind of just sat back and she was like, uh, if you're feeling ready, then like, let your body do it. And I was just so relieved to hear that. And she just sat back and it was the first time it was definitely more coached after having an epidural and they were more hands-on and they were kind of letting me do my thing. But this time I really got to do my thing and that just felt so good. Um, the first couple of pushes though, <laughs> was me just like peeing all over the bed because I got dehydrated in my first labor. I was basically chugging water the entire time. And I don't know why I was trying to be so polite when I was in transition, but I just remember being like, I'm so sorry. And the nurses were like, it's okay. Like make room for the baby, get your pee out. Um, but I just kept apologizing. But after that, um, I was really ready to go. I pushed a couple of times over 15 minutes and it was slow and controlled. We had music on again and it was really great. I was super aware. Um, and I just remember being like, okay, there's the ring of fire. I'm feeling it. It's happening. Um, but it was really a relief for me. I know some women say it is not a relief at all. It's awful for me and my body. It was, it felt like a relief to push. Um, and he was born at 601 and, um, Ryan passed him up to me again and he, we did delayed cord clamping, all the same things. We were so tired. Um, I was more tired after this one, although it was shorter, but I also think with my daughter, I don't think I had a full night of sleep since before she was born. So we went into it a little sleepy and, um, yeah, my husband fell asleep again while I did skin to skin, baby latched and nursed really quickly. Um, and yeah, it was, I, I just felt great after this labor, um, I was proud of myself. I was proud of how everything went despite some things going a little differently than I planned, but I just felt great and supported. So it was wonderful. Yeah. That's makes such a big difference how you yeah. feel about those around you and, and being mm -hmm. an active, you know, participant, well, <laughs> decision maker. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So do you feel like this um, birth experience affected your postpartum any differently or how did that look for you? So my postpartum was great. I felt even better at the hospital. Um, I mean, second time around, I think you know to expect to. Like I was so used to being sleep deprived. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh my God, not as much of an adjustment. <laughs> no, no. Both my kids are just not sleepers. And yeah, that first night at the hospital, sometimes they say, Oh, they might sleep after a long, hard journey to get here, but not my children. Um, <laughs> 
but I, I was ready for that. So it didn't affect me as much. And I had a hard time postpartum for a little while trying with my first trying to kind of fit into the norms of sleep. Like sleep is just such a hot topic with parents and yeah. And people have their opinions and I think with my daughter, eventually I learned to let that go and just do what's best for us. And so going into that with my son, it was good. Um, physically for me, postpartum, I, I felt really good. Um, nursing went really well. Um, we're still nursing. He's still nursing. And with my daughter, I had a little bit of um, pain in the beginning and cracks and had to see lactation consultant. Um, but with him, um, it was a little bit easier in terms of that, but he was born March 9th. And I think one of the hardest things about my postpartum was he was born Monday and that following weekend is when New Hampshire here went into lockdown. So mm. I had these big plans. My daughter was at daycare three days a week. Oh. My mom was around. So all that kind of went away and I found myself just like at home all the time with my toddler and my baby, which was fine. And, but we didn't see my mom for two months who are so close with, I mean, everyone went through it, but that was challenging. And I kind of had a pivot. I didn't get to watch the list of shows that I had going, um, laying with my baby. Instead, I was watching children's shows and playing with my toddler, which in the end I'm so thankful for, um, it was an adjustment, but yeah. yeah, it actually, I had an, I had a much better time adjusting, um, postpartum fr- with one to two kids than I did zero to one. That's good. That's impressive yeah. too, considering, like you said, the timing, I'm sure you felt grateful to have given birth before the lockdown, oh my gosh. but then I, I, it affected yeah. your postpartum so much. Yeah, I can't like if he was if he was just due or I had him a little bit later, I feel like it would have been in that time where who knows what labor would have looked like right. because they they were making all these rules and they didn't know what to do and I can't even imagine. So I do find I feel lucky in that sense for yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, well, do you have any resources you want to share here at the end? Yeah, I have a couple. The Ina May Gaskin book, I, I read that both times. Yeah, The Guide to Childbirth. And then um, a couple local resources to me in New Hampshire was something postpartum. Um, her name's Chelsea McPhail, and she is like a sleep consultant and actually like was an acquaintance of mine looking for somebody to do a trial with. So I did it with her. And she's all um, baby led sleep and she's just a really good touch point, someone to talk to and someone to follow um, and just helped us a little bit in a sense with um, getting to know my daughter and some tips for an easier bedtime and everything. And so she's local to New Hampshire and that's just a good resource and really supportive Um there. Um, another local resource is, um, Beth Janelle and she is local and virtual and she is a trainer, a personal trainer, but also certified, um, with women's health and knows a lot about pelvic floor health and helped me to create workout plans to, um, get in shape and strengthen my pelvic floor and work on that as well, which was really important for me the second time around when I had a lot of issues to have someone helping me take care of my body in an an appropriate way. So that's another local resource that I used. Awesome. Well, send me those links and we'll put them on the show notes page for sure. And then where's the best place for people to reach out to you? So I am on Instagram Um, mostly I have Facebook, but I'm mostly on Instagram and my Instagram name is Meg dot Hubbard six and I am private, but anyone can feel free to reach out to me. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for sharing your stories today. This was really, really great. Thank you so much. 
Now I'm going to chat with Anissa about Expectful, today's sponsor. And don't forget, you can go to expectful.com slash birth hour to get an extended 14-day free trial. Hi, Anissa. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on today to chat with me about Expectful. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be chatting with you today. All right. Can you start off by just reminding listeners a little bit about you and how you got started with Expectful? Of course. Um, so my name, again, is Anissa Amat, and I serve as the head of community at Expectful, which is the meditation and sleep app for fertility, pregnancy, and parenthood. So I personally discovered Expectful during the second trimester of my pregnancy. Um, it was actually a couple of weeks after my 20-week scan. I remember so vividly um, during my 20 week scan, um, you know, they were looking at the baby and measuring her out and everything. And um, they, they checked my placenta. And then um, after like checking her and the ultrasound tech was like, I'm going to go get the doctor. And I remember looking at my husband and I was, I instantly, I was like, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, so my doctor came in, she rescanned the baby, looked at my placenta and everything, and she expressed concern about my daughter's weight. And um, that led to weekly visits with her and with a high-risk specialist. I think I was seeing a high-risk specialist twice a week and my OBGYN. Um, so I had been, everything had been great during my pregnancy up until that point. And so I just believed that it would be, continued to be perfect. And when it wasn't, um, I placed so much blame on myself. I convinced myself that there was something that I was doing wrong. Um, so a couple of weeks after my 20 week scan, someone on my Instagram had like given expectful a shout out. And I remember downloading the app. And the first meditation that I did was trusting your body. And I remember meditating and I remember crying but I remember reconnecting with my body and I remember this meditation just really supporting me and encouraging me and reminding me that my body knew what it was doing and to just release this need to like control every step of this journey mm -hmm. and to just trust my body. So yeah. that's kind of, that's my story with how I discovered Expectful and now I'm, I'm writing meditations I'm um, two years later and just, just, you know, my main mission is just to give women what I received um, yeah. when I was meditating with Expectful throughout my pregnancy. I love that. It's so great. So we've talked about um, Expectful in a few of our past interviews that we started a couple months ago and people can go back and listen to those. But today we're really going to dive deeper into this concept of self-care, which is kind of a buzzword these days, I think. Um, and it can be really yeah. challenging to, you know, first of all, figure out what that it looks like for you and then to make time for it. So how do you talk to your users about making self-care a priority? So I think this begins with changing the narrative of what we have been con convinced self-care is supposed to look like. Um, like you said, self-care has become trendy. Um, but along with this trend, there's also like this image of what it's supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not always going out to get a massage or getting your nails done or anything like that. While well, that's nice, um, but caring for yourself can range from, God, eating a slice of pizza because you want to, or soaking in a bath, or watching your favorite show on Netflix, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's where it begins, is first giving ourselves permission to redefine self-care and then knowing that caring for ourselves is what we deserve. And I mean, just just thinking about what are the things that you love doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? Before motherhood, right? Mm -hmm. um, whether that's running or walking through a museum, whatever it is, mm 
just mm-hmm. giving that to you, giving that back to yourself. Right. Right. Yeah. That's so great. And, and so important to talk about, I think, especially, you know, with the way things have changed <laughs> over the last year, living in a pandemic, we're having to redefine self-care in a lot of ways. And, um, I'd love to hear what some of your favorite forms of self-care are. Oh my gosh. So definitely meditation. Um, I am also, I'm an avid reader um, and I'm a writer, um, so even outside of uh, writing meditations, I'm also a poet. Um, but like I said, going back to meditation, that's definitely in like my top three. Uh, so I have meditated on and off since around 2014 or 2015. Um, and my practice has drastically shifted since becoming a mama. But just like we tell our listeners, if I can carve out five minutes a day to meditate and to just be with myself, it results in a dynamic shift in my day, in my mood, in the way that I process the unknowns of motherhood and the surprises of my day to day. (laughs) Um, So in the Expectful app, our meditations are offered in five, 10 and 20 minute increments. So even if you start with the five-minute meditation, you are still cultivating a practice and allowing yourself to just simply sit and be with yourself. And actually, our five-minute meditations are our most popular and most used by our listeners. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all by that. I know when I was using it during pregnancy, I always went for the shorter ones. And then as I got (laughs) more into a groove, I would maybe expand the longer ones, especially the sleep ones. I like the long ones on those because I need more time to fall asleep. But (laughs) but it is really neat that you can, um, you know, reap the benefits from meditating for even just five minutes. But five minutes sounds really easy, but I'm sure, as you know, in the work you do, that it could still be really intimidating to actually get started. So what advice do you give to, you know, brand new meditators? (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. So there are all of these common misconceptions about meditation and how it's supposed to feel or what it's supposed to look like. And you don't have to have a meditation pillow or a dedicated space to meditate. You don't have to sit cross-legged or in an upright position in order to reap the benefits. Um, And many of our meditations, specifically for pregnant women, women are guided to find a position that feels most comfortable to them, whether that's reclining back in a bed surrounded with pillows with their feet propped up. Um, And we also have walking meditations that women can listen to while they're enjoying a walk outside. Uh, So another idea about meditation that um, some people might find intimidating is that it's supposed to quiet your thoughts. And what I've learned is that more than anything, meditation allows you to sit and be with your thoughts to process big emotions and decisions. It is a moment in time where you are able to sit and kind of sort through your thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. And this is always important, whether you are a new parent or planning your family, because you may be dealing with new issues. Well, not maybe, but you are dealing with new issues and experiences that haven't come up for you before. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I heard from so many women using the app that they were afraid that they weren't meditating correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, or even we've had users who have written in um, and they've said like, there's not enough guidance. I need more guidance um, because, you know, there are those moments of silence and it's just like you and your thoughts, right? You're not thinking about um, what's being said in the meditation. Um, so there, there's no right way to do it. And I just want our listeners to just believe that for themselves and for their practice. Um, And we made a 10-day pregnancy meditation journey that will support them so they feel confident and excited about cultivating a meditation practice. I love that. You shared so many good little tidbits there that I like just been waiting to, to tell you how much I love it all. Because I think the one thing that really stuck out for me when I was using expectful during pregnancy was that aspect of find a position you're comfortable in, because I've really never understood meditation where it's like, you must sit like this, you know, and I'm sure there are benefits to that. But when you're super pregnant, 
uh, you're not going to do something that doesn't feel comfortable. So (laughs) I love that that's the first part of every meditation. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And I love that you talk about, you know, redefining what we believe meditation to be because you want it to work for you and actually be doing it. So are there any other tools of support that you guys offer over at Expectful for first timers? Absolutely. So we host live guided meditation events, which is a free series called Meditate Together. These sessions are intimate and customized to where you are in your journey. So for example, we'll have a session for women who are trying to conceive or a session for mamas who are seeking to provide themselves with more care and nourishment. Um, And these events are great for first-time meditators because it allows you to be in community with other women who are meditating, Mm -hmm. and it also makes you feel a little less alone as you begin to cultivate a meditation practice. Um, So our live guided events are, they're so special to me. Um, We have women from across the world who join us and who have shared what they're excited about or what they're vulnerable about. And it just brings me back to our mission, to wanting women to not feel like they're alone, no matter what stage of their journey they're on. That's so cool. I've been so impressed with the ways that people have been connecting virtually during this past year. And um, and so I can just imagine how cool that is to add in the meditation aspect of it and the sharing. Yeah, it's been so perfect. You know, we were thinking about ways to just bring our community together Mm -hmm. during the pandemic. And this was just, it's just been so perfect and and so just nourishing and it's it's so fulfilling. So how can people find out about these events and sign up or just go ahead and hop right in and try out the app? So they can register in the event section of the Expectful app. Or follow us on Instagram. It's just at Expectful. Um, And like I said, these events are available to anyone. And to try out the app, they can start a free trial at Expectful.com or by downloading Expectful in the App Store. Perfect. We'll link to those in the show notes as well. And thank you so much again for coming on and chatting with me today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much again to Megan for sharing her birth stories with us and to Expectful for sponsoring this episode. Don't forget, you can go to expectful.com slash birth hour to get started with that extended 14-day free trial. And if you want more information from today's episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Megan's name in the search bar and her show notes will come right up for you. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.